Hey everyone, a very warm welcome and uh, a huge thanks to all of you who are taking the time to join us um, on this journey we are on to unravel the decade. Um, if, the if this decade is all about the power of technology or humans leveraging the power of technology for good, for impact, to solve some of the biggest problems that we are faced with. Uh, the stories that we want to talk about or we want to share are those of the real heroes, the people who are making it happen, who are working with technology to drive that impact. A huge thanks for the tremendous response we received to our, our first conversation um, with, with Abhishek Bodhar of uh, uh, the Museum of Art and Photography India. It was amazing to see how you all responded to it. And I'm tremendously excited to bring our guest today, um, who's, uh, who's someone, uh, you know, I absolutely, uh, I'm a huge fan of, uh, love their work. Um, and it's none other than, I would say, Mr. Positivity himself, Mr. Deeman Farik. So Deeman, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Thank you so much, Debjani, for having me here. You know, uh, Devant, I have to start with this question, right? Because when Better India started, especially at that point, media was all about sensationalism. I mean, news was, news had to be bad news. It had to be sensational. I remember speaking to a very, very senior editor and he told me that, in fact, I was sharing an excellent story with him, which I thought was so wonderful and he heard me out and he said hey it's an excellent story but you know what in order to sell that story we need something we need a hook we need something about what didn't work or what went wrong or who was the villain and you know if you give me that then we can sell this story then it attracts the eyeballs and in that kind of uh, of an environment you come out with a platform to share positive news nothing but positive news, right? Um, what was the thinking behind that, David? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, uh, Devjani. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, uh, especially from the traditional media sort of circles, uh, have been pleasantly surprised, I'd say, that, uh, you know, people do want to read the kind of stories that we share, you know. But uh, Devjani, this, this whole idea goes back, uh, way back in 2008, um, when, uh, you know, my wife and I, we start our day with a cup of tea in the morning and browse through the newspaper, right? And we were doing this every day. And it, it was one of those days where we, you know, page after page, what we were reading was as though everything uh, is uh, bad. Everything is kind of going down the drain and there's absolutely no hope. Uh, that's how it was that, that one morning. So, you, you know, you see the headline that there's some crime and there's uh, scandals and there's gossip yeah. and all of that stuff. And, we, and, you know, we just kind of start thinking to ourselves that, but if you look around us, the circles we are in, the people we meet on our commute to office, the people we meet at the restaurants we go to, they're really fundamentally nice people and, and doing such amazing things. And I'm not talking about people setting up social enterprises or NGOs. I'm just talking about day-to-day -day people that you meet um, are so nice. And, and the majority of the people we meet are such people, right? So somewhere we kind of felt that this is truly a very wrong, or I would say a heavily skewed misrepresentation of what is probably truly happening out there, right? Probably a lot of the spotlight is going to what's broken um, and not enough. Or in fact, at that point, nothing, nothing. of a spotlight was going to what's working, right? Um, so we said, hey, look, there are enough um, set of organizations that are working to showcase what's broken. And that is, of course, very, very, very important. And that's needed because only if you know what's broken, you can go fix it. So that does a particular job in society. But at the same time, there needs to be a platform that focuses on what's working 
because by doing that, by archiving these kind of solutions, change makers, and all of that, we stand to inspire you know, millions and millions of people so that a lot of these pockets of good, which are in silos, how do we kind of amplify and make them sort of pan country or even pan globe sort of initiatives. So really the whole idea started with that, you know, leafing through the newspaper in the morning and said, look, we need to read better. So it wasn't even like, hey, we want to start this, right? It was like, let's, let's, start, let's, start, let's start reading about what's working. So we went on the internet, you know, early days of the internet back then, they were searching and, you know, uh, magazines after magazines, blogs after blogs, you actually do not find yeah. anything or yeah. any documentation of what's working. So we said, okay, fine, this is not going to work. Let us start putting it down somewhere. So we would go around on weekends, just Saturdays and Sundays and, and meeting people, doing, doing some very interesting things and putting it up on a blog. I was just more from our reference that, look, mm -hmm. we will remember this, that's all. It wasn't even like, hey, we want to distribute this, right? So we started documenting this, putting it up, and then just sending it to friends and family. You know, sometimes we would come across something interesting and we would just send it, hey, guys, you know, we went here this weekend and see. And through that, word of mouth kind of started kicking in. And then we realized that a lot of people would write back to us if we missed a weekend, if we were traveling or something, they would write, hey, look, uh, you know, you guys have forgotten to kind of write about it. And that's when I think it struck us that there are many, many more people like us, like, like you, who see that there is a big opportunity and a gap here. And I think it kind of coincided with the larger um, realization that the need to get inspired is a universal need. It's not restricted to the career you belong to or the interests you have. Everybody, right? From, from it's, it's a human to. thing. It, it's, it's in our DNAs. It's exactly, right? Like, yeah, you know, you're, you're in school or you're a senior citizen. Right? You, you want or have the need to get inspired. Yeah. And we said, that's really where we should really focus all our efforts on. And, and so, so that really was the genesis of the idea of when we started it. Wow. Um, you know, you've, you've not just challenged status quo, but you've literally taken a conscious decision to swim against the tide, right? Whether it was what you would focus on or even um, I think when you guys launch Better India, uh, the whole concept of online news or online news platforms was not still a thing in India. It was just about picking up, right? So why choose to go with an online platform, a digital platform versus say going at that point, the safer route or considered the safer route of a you know, printed, published uh, magazine, et cetera? Yeah. Um, I think that comes a lot from... Uh... The fact that both Anuradha and I are engineers and we come from technology backgrounds, you know, I've, I've, I'm a computer science engineer, I've built technology products. I understood the internet you know, to whatever extent I can claim that, but I at least understood the technologies underlying the internet. And I sort of realized that um, this was going to be the future, um, that distribution of content and content consumption was going yeah. to really get a sore. Um, and the only way to kind of do that cost effectively and at large scale was going to be if we went digital um, and started distributing content online. Um, we also kind of at least knew how to sort of you know, set up content online, how to make it easy for people to read, easy for people to share, uh, and, and then leverage social media to, to really take these stories far and wide. Um, I know there's a lot of you know, ridicule for social media and stuff, but I think it's such an amazing point uh, in time that we live in, where through the click of a button, billions of people are getting connected. Uh, you know, one message you post on Twitter and you have hundreds of thousands of people kind of knowing it, right? And so how could you really leverage this to, to inspire people to start influencing mindsets and to drive impact, right? How do you get people to start thinking about problems uh, from a solution framework? And you can do that with, with the internet. Um, and so we were very clear that we'll, we'll, we'll kind of, you know, do this uh, on the internet. And we were also very clear that, look, we will actually take this content to all social media platforms. It's not going to be, this is another sort of thing we went against the tide. Uh, this was a time when everyone would tell us, hey, look, if, if you're building a website, it should be, all your content should be on your website. People should come to your site. I was going to ask you that, yeah. Right. Yeah. And yeah. Um, only then it's, it's kind of Especially in those days. 
it's especially in those so the entire wall garden you know my Correct. it has to be my wall garden and all the content yeah. that we put in was very strong exactly uh, we were talking to some very early stage backers and then they were like it has to be your app which people need to download yeah. it has to be your website your content should not and we said no look that's not the point of this venture the point is that we need to take these stories and give them legs we need to take these stories to where people reside and people reside on these social networks and why would i not kind of take this content there right and and the impact would then be massive because you're suddenly talking to millions of people so we kind of changed that also and we we really built huge followings on all the all the social media network channels that you see today and the impact we have seen has been tremendous we have seen people come forward to um rescue farmers from poverty we've seen people come in and fund urban slum schools um people have come in and volunteered and uh, you know brought water and sanitation in villages so massive massive citizen led movements um to drive change purely because you know we brought this ushering and this whole positivity in all the social networking channels when I mean, the prime minister talked about it um yeah. i was thrilled i was because you know the better india for me really is my happy place it's where i go to when i just want to take a break from all this you know nonsense around us and i just want to read something that inspires me that's my that's the place i go to um so it was wonderful to see you know, the kind of uh, recognition you guys have got but you have to give me this answer very honestly hands on heart did you and anuradha really expect this kind of a response when you started this off <laughs> <laughs> i think the answer is is a very emphatic no <laughs> uh, we we did not uh, uh you know like i said it started as a movement which we were very passionate about and and really i think what started taking off is that week after week we would get emails uh from some random stranger we've never met uh, who would just write in to say how a particular story changed his or her sort of life his or her mindset um and some of the protagonists who we were talking about or writing about would you know kid back after two weeks saying oh you know because you guys we've had this whole team of people who came down they've donated so much money they volunteered at our yeah. organization and all of this impact and i think really what just kept us going was that look we're making a difference so let's continue uh and week after week those emails started piling up um and then it got to a point where one day we said look this is this is getting much larger than we thought really and that's you know that's really when we quit our sort of day jobs and um uh, got on to it uh to scale this whole thing uh but i think the underlying essence always was that there's so much impact already happening imagine we take this to million people yeah then the moment we reach a million people say imagine we get to tens of millions of people and the moment we got to tens of millions and now we are at hundreds of millions you know and we're starting to continuously see the impact that's happening because of this uh so on it so yeah to answer your story uh, you answer your question we I, i don't think we ever anticipated uh, but uh, it's it's been uh, very very gratifying and um, uh, incredible to see the kind of change that's happened because of this initiative oh, absolutely yeah. and you know there's another myth that you guys have broken um uh, you you've broken the myth that uh, it's only negativity that sells you broke you know positivity doesn't pay i think you get completely shattered that one the other myth that you and anuradha have broken because if i'm not wrong she too is an engineer right that's right that's and she was also in the it industry i think the other myth the two of you are broken have broken is that engineers do not know how to tell stories <laughs> i mean today the two of you at least i think you two are some india's best storytellers i mean you know you bring you tell stories that people absolutely look forward to listening to um so so there's a message for all you engineers the power of storytelling really really pays it doesn't matter whether you're an engineer or not but we'll come back to that in a bit uh, dimant um you know the other thing i wanted to talk to you about was when i look at better india today and i have to actually when I, when i knew i was going to talk to you i reached out to quite a few people in the industry the leaders to just see what what are the two or three words that come um to their mind when they think better india and without fail positivity of course was the first thing that comes to everybody's mind it's very interesting the other word that comes to a lot of people's mind including mine is trust mm. um and it's it's how this community how you're building a tremendously trustworthy brand 
And that is something, by the way, your peers in the industry are watching because that's something that most people struggle tremendously with. But how you're building a trustworthy brand and just the power of trust in the community that drives that engagement. You talked about the engagement, right? People would not engage with you if they did not trust you. Um, and I think, I honestly think, Riman, that's that's your biggest differentiator. And that's one of your biggest strengths um, that will really pay off, um, especially in this hyper all digital world. So talk a little bit about, I mean, was this even a conscious decision that we have to build trust or did it just happen? And um, how are you going about it? How are you thinking about it right now? Yeah, no, Devjani, as you rightly pointed out, I think uh, trust is the central tenet for us as an organization. And the reason for that is pretty simple, right? Because look, here we are um, countering all the negativity that's around by sharing information about things that are working, about people making a difference, about inspiring events. Um, and all it takes is for one story, which is not true or not uh, sort of validated for the entire uh, sort of, uh, you know, the better India to kind of collapse, right? And lose trust. I think so trust becomes super, super critical for us, especially because you're spreading information. And there's a very sort of, very sort of, you know, as you start scaling, it becomes so much easier to kind of cross over the line and your information can become misinformation. And that's something you can't really afford. Um, having said that, um, I think the, the whole idea of why trust was so important for us started right at the beginning. It started right at the beginning because we were very clear that this is something we want to put up to document stuff that's working that we would reference. And if it was not going to be something we would ever use, then it should not be documented, right? Um, so that was, that's, the, that's the thumb rule with which we started. And then we kind of, as we kind of kept scaling, we were very clear that, look, if at any point in time, you're going to be putting out stuff which you yourself do not believe in, or you yourself are not in awe of, then you shouldn't be putting it. That was a very, very clear mandate. That are you going to be reading this piece of content after you publish it? Um, if not, then I don't think you should be kind of publishing it. And the moment we kind of you know, started living by that, we realized that what we inadvertently kind of started doing is staying true to the promise with which we started. So just staying true to the promise for years and years and years is what, you know, is now labeled as trust. And that's really effectively what happened. Um, I must say, in a, like, you know, in a, in a, in a country like ours, uh, extremely hard to build trustworthy brands because there's just so much noise, right? And you have so many other sort of uh, avenues of distraction. Especially in the business of news especially in the business of news, right? And so how do you kind of do that? And how do you deal with that? I think the simple answer is clearly, clearly defining what your purpose is, making sure that that purpose is sacrosanct and whatever you do is in line with that promise of that purpose, right? And I think the moment you do that, um, and there is no denying that there is a gestation period. You have to do it for that period of time. You cannot become a trustworthy brand overnight. Um, so it takes years uh, uh, because people need to see you consistently in the same light. You know, uh, the moment that light wavers, um, you know, the whole skepticism levels again go up. Um, so you need to give it that much time. You need to be consistent, persistent uh, in terms of keeping up with your promise. And I think that's really how you end up building trust. So one of the things that a lot of leaders struggle with, Damon, since we are talking about trust is how do you inculcate that same discipline, passion, whatever you want to call it, within every single employee, especially as you, your team sizes grow, as you, you know, become, uh, grow from a five people team to a 5,000 people team. Now you're growing, your, your team is not just growing, but I believe it's spread across India. Uh, how do you how do you ensure that they all believe in this, um, you know, in, the, in this in this really the value that we yeah. have to stay truthful? Yeah. Um, 
every every time they write an article for better india yeah no that's a good question and uh, it it is a typically a, one of the hardest sort of challenges as you scale something like this right um what we ended up spending a lot of time on is to make sure that the senior core leadership that we have um comprises of people who are as invested in this as a passion project um as the founders are and that part i think was non negotiable um you know and so it's been interesting that the core set of people who joined us way back in 2015 when this became a sort of a venture um are still with us right? it's been 7 years i know you told me that and i could not believe it <laughs> yeah yeah right uh, and none of the none of that core team um comes from a media background or a journalism background they're pretty much all um engineering background um the reason why i highlight that is not that engineers are better storytellers but what i want to really kind of dwell on is that uh this is a bunch of people who came together for a particular passion and if that passion doesn't trump uh over everything else then it's going to be very hard to kind of yeah. pull it off yeah. so these are people who, who truly believed in the idea that look someone needs to amplify all the good that's happening in this country someone needs to archive the nation's goodness right and we are going to make this happen because it's not been done um and i think that group kind of came in so so what happens is that now you have a senior leadership who kind of build this along with you so there is absolute clarity in terms of what the better india as a brand as a value system uh what does it imbibe and then when you start looking at you know the the second rung of people that you're coming in when you start to scale um very very important to a have a very clear guidelines in terms of what is acceptable and what is not uh and we also sort of every week go through examples of what is something that the better india would not do um it's a lot it's a lot easier to kind of convey what we don't do what we don't do what we don't do because then they, they, it's a very very clear understanding of what the better india kind of focuses on um and that is carried out by the senior leadership um uh, in the organization you know the people who came in early uh making sure that the people who you know, follow us later on are able to kind of get that in this so so they go through a, a rigorous training program and then there are there's gatekeeping at different levels and then eventually once you've been in the system for a while you 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 get a very clear sense of whether this is something we do or we don't do so that's really how we've grown i think the challenges will kind of you know become harder and harder as you keep scaling up but we've had like three levels of scaling up so far and we've we've managed to kind of get to a point where i think we have sort of a playbook in place I I really hope you crack that because I I strongly believe that's your biggest differentiator and I also think the kind of people you will need um uh, they're a little different you know from uh what's 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 there out there uh you, you, you need people who care yeah. who have that and th- that's the same for NASCOM and I know one joins NASCOM for salaries right mm-hmm. they join NASCOM because they want to get an opportunity to do something uh for the country for the industry and I think um um it's frankly a privilege to be part of an organization that attracts people like that so I completely relate with what you're saying you know I'm, I'm switching tracks a bit to uh technology right um you come from a tech industry and rather comes from a tech industry um and you you've built in my mind uh i think one of the most powerful digital platforms because this is a platform that will shape how we not just how we think of india but i think this is a platform that also shapes um or inculcates that feeling of pride in a lot of us because we and that that's so important for a country that's so important for a country with such a young demographics like like india um so let's talk a bit about technology the role that you see uh, technology play um in in your journey uh, not just what is done till now but going forward anything that you are excited about in terms of what technology can do um i okay you know again like coming from a technology background i i am a firm believer that technology is the biggest level that we have today um even if you look at india's growth story right the entire leap frogging while the industrial revolution was something we you know we kind of missed uh, or we were sort of you know out of that whole thing we really leapfrogged in terms of mobile technology and today the 
the manner in which we do payments, for instance, right? I, unparalleled, the, you know, the, the UPI doesn't exist anywhere in, else in the world. Uh, and that has truly leveled the, the, the playing field for everybody. Earlier, it was just the credit card owners who could just swipe at places and, you know, you have access to digital payments today. Today, anybody you know can can scan that QR code and pay ten rupees to anybody else, right? So, um, I think I think it's only going to be technology that's going to kind of change things, and which is where I I, I truly believe that um, you know organizations like NASCOM, which are of course at the forefront of you know working with all these technology companies to kind of drive that change, uh, I'm even more bullish in terms of what's going to happen over the next ten years and twenty years in terms of how healthcare will go tech enabled, how education will go tech enabled, the whole augmentation of every core sector with technology, I think is the only way forward for us. And I think we are continuing to see so many innovations happening yeah. in this field. You know? um, I, I, I still remember some of the stories that you know, we've covered and, and one of them uh, one of them was inspired, like, you know, when Uber Ola kind of came in and, hey, you know, you have 10 minutes in within 10 minutes, you have a taxi service and then, uh, uh, a very enterprising person, uh, you know, started the company saying, if, if 10 minutes can get your cab, why can't we get 10 minutes ambulance? And, you know, it's building an entire um, tech platform and a market uh, sort of a platform for getting ambulances together and you can book an ambulance in 10 minutes. Um, if I remember correctly, that startup is called uh, Stand Plus. Um, again, you're now starting to see elements of technology which were built for, you know, rest of the world. Now we're starting to adapt it to our needs, right? And I think that's really the way in which it's going to um, sort of scale. Um, there's another very interesting innovation called Echovation, which is actually, a, you know, there's a public-private uh, collaboration that happened uh, between IIT Delhi graduates uh, and, 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 and actually a district collector, a deputy commissioner of a, of a district in Bihar, where they have now started doing virtual reality-based classes for government girls' schools. You know? So now these government girls' schools are yeah. actually able yeah. to visually yeah. see stuff that's happening across the world and um, uh, at, at really like one tenth of the cost of what would have otherwise been required to uh, you know take them to these uh, uh, you know modern city schools and so on uh, I, I'm just really really kicked about what technology will bring to uh, improve education and healthcare which I, I personally think are the two very core fundamental uh, areas where if we kind of really solve for that uh, it's, it's going to be massive in terms of the 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 impact that this country will leave. You know, when I think of your platform and I think of the possibilities, um, the two things that I dream of, right? One is um, opening Better India and listening to the stories in whatever language I want uh, without you having to, you know, churn out uh, websites in so many different languages. <laughs> We're just using the power of NLP or, or whatever. And the other one is um, actually getting into the story, engaging in the story, whether it's my virtual avatar or whatever, but actually going in and being part of that community, seeing the story happen, play out in front of my eyes without leaving this little desk of mine, um, you know, so just still, the opportunities are, are amazing, especially when you, when you think of a platform like Better India. But, you know, one of the things, and I recently met uh, Trevor Noah, he was in India, wow. and I had a very interesting conversation with him about whether technology will actually play a role to bring down some of the misinformation and fake news in media, or will it play a role to significantly amplify the same? Um, and be before I tell you what he said, we'd love to get your point of view. Um, look, I, 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 I always think that uh, technology is a tool yeah. and uh, it really can become what we want it to become Absolutely. Um, in our hands. So. Uh, in the hands of the right people, um, it will be leveraged to drive change, which has never been seen before. And I think in the hands of uh, people who don't have the right intentions, you will continue to see it being exploited um, because technology doesn't understand right or wrong, right? That's such a human construct. Um, so I think, I think it will always be a double-edged um, thing. But increasingly, I think we will as our technologies kind of become more mature, I think we will start putting in better and better checks and balances to ensure that technology continues to be used for good. 
Yeah, I think you said it. It's uh, the onus is ultimately on us uh, humans, and uh, you know while we talk a lot about the require the the need for uh, standards, etc., fra frameworks, regulation to ensure technology is does not uh, divide further divide or uh, create harm. I actually think we need standards and maybe some ethical framework for us humans so that uh, we we don't use technology to 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 drive uh, divides and uh, create cause harm so yeah and tra travel you know one interesting thing travel talked about is that there's no common notion of truth mm -hmm. how you see truth is very different from how i see truth maybe you know and it all depends on the moment in time we are in the life that we are in and the problems that we are facing so so yeah i think it's a, it's a pretty interesting times ahead as we as we figure all this out yeah 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 but i, I but i think there's still no doubt about the fact that it, it is going to be technology that's going to take us to the next level there's yeah. absolutely no no doubt about it yeah no there it, it's uh and I, I, I think you you absolutely summed it up brilliantly the amount it's going to depend on how we use it or do not use it yeah so exactly. a lot depends on that yeah um I, I you know my team really wanted me to ask you this question that there's so many amazing stories in in better in, in on better india uh, which is your favorite <laughs> all-time favorite if you could pick one <laughs> uh you know i think uh that's a that's a really really tough one right but <laughs> Um, I think I'll go with I'll go with this one particular thing, which is which really kind of got us uh, to say that we need to scale the better India, and this happened way back. I think it, it was early 2015 um, or early 2016 uh, when this is the early days of WhatsApp, right? Um, so it was a very fascinating thing, right? And it was largely restricted to, of course, people who had cell phones, and uh, and you know some of them were using WhatsApp. Uh, one of our one of our colleagues, uh, while she was in uh, Vidarbha region in Maharashtra, and she was kind of there, she she actually uh, met a group of farmers. Uh, you know, I think there was about four farmers um, who were using WhatsApp to counsel each other in this very crisis hit region, right, where farmer suicides were so high. Wow. Uh, you had uh, uh, yeah, lot, lack of information on a lot of things. And this here was suddenly a group of four, four people, farmers using WhatsApp uh, and sharing information about prices, about you know, if someone came came across something and then counseling each other and all of that. And we thought, wow, this is fascinating. And I'm really talking about like early years of WhatsApp in India, right? So we said, wow, this is fascinating. Uh, we should write about this, how someone's using technology, how farmers in a remote district in, in Vidarbha are using technology to kind of trust. So we wrote about this. Um, and I, and you know, back then this story really, really went viral on social media um, to the extent that it reached the district collector uh, yeah. of that region. Yeah. Um, and he actually then took this story, uh, got it translated into Marathi, and he got a thousand two hundred farmers to come together, and he read the story out to them, and yeah. and and that was incredible for me that here was a story published in English on a digital platform uh, about someone using technology. And suddenly 1,200 farmers were informed about it. Not only that, within the next two weeks, they were all made part of various groups on WhatsApp. So they suddenly you had 1,200 farmers exposed to the idea that they can counsel each other and share information with each other. All due to an article being published online by us, um, you know, shared on Facebook. Um, and to me, that was really the power of storytelling and its impact. And we were like, wow, um, we never thought this would happen, really. The kind of impact, like suddenly with one story impacting thousand farmers, that, uh, we never anticipated that. And, and that is why that story remains my favorite. Wow. Uh, beautiful. I mean, I'm getting goosebumps just listening to that story. What a fantastic story. Uh, Demon, you know, now you started off as a platform for positive news. Um, and sharing. I, I love the word you used, archiving the goodness of India. It's a powerful statement. Mm -hmm. You're now working with a lot of industry, a lot of companies who want to be part of this journey and who are doing good, but 
you know, want to figure out how to do it better or tell their stories better. You also, you and Anuradha um, expanded into an e-commerce uh, venture. So there's a lot happening. Uh, but what's your thinking with respect to what's next for you guys? And, you know, four, five years down the line, how do you see Better India? What, what are what are the different things it, it does? Yeah, uh, you know, we are, we're, we're kind of, uh, both Anuradha and I gu are guided by one core sort of uh, mission, right? That how could we leverage the internet to drive large scale impact? Hmm. Um, so far, so impact is still at the core of impact is at the core. I mean, if it's not impact, we would rather be doing something else. Okay. Right? Um, so yeah, so it's a very simple statement we ask ourselves: How do we leverage the internet slash technology to drive large scale impact? Right now, there are many ways to leverage technology and uh, 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 you know the internet to drive change. The first, we believe that it's the first step that we have taken is through the power of storytelling. So we have taken storytelling as a means as of now to drive impact on the internet. The second phase came in when we used the power of e-commerce to drive impact. Well, you know, that's when we um, launched something called the Better Home. The idea was that could we start giving customers an option of completely biodegradable, environmentally sustainable products to use in their uh, homes um, because you know homes is where we spend so much of our time and but half the things that we bring in are toxic um, cleaners and all of that and we, we came up with a line um, which are completely based on plant-based enzymes and microbes and uh, we launched the better home um, so the idea there was that now again you're leveraging the internet um, to drive environmental impact in, at a household level uh, we are now kind of uh, starting to, you know, we're working with some of the largest brands of India, um, focusing on different sort of aspects and allowing them to narrate their story, but partnering with us in order to go deeper into those stories, right? Um, so we work with, you know, we work with FMCG brands around sustainability. We work with uh, financial institutions to talk about financial inclusion in rural India. We talk, you know, we work with innovation foundations. To, to unearth social uh, enterprises in the country and basically continuing to create this movement uh, across sectors and categories. Uh, if you were to ask me what I see the Better India eventually, I think it's going to be an ecosystem of multiple uh, businesses with each of them going deeper in the impact space in different categories, be it environment, be it education, you know, be it health, be it livelihoods uh, and so on. All of it, sort of held by the fabric of storytelling. Do you see, do you see yourselves coming, uh, going beyond India at some point? We, we do, uh, because we get a lot of requests from uh, different Everybody countries. Everybody needs good stories yeah. to be told. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And we get a lot of requests from a lot of countries saying, hey, you know, how could we, how could we set this up here uh, and so on. And uh, we, we, that, would, that would be lovely. Um, we haven't yet kind of uh, started putting any work on that line, but it's there at the back of our mind that we should be able to kind of take this and replicate this playbook globally as well. Well, more power to you and Anu. Uh, you know, I, I just, I would, I would love to see uh, <laughs> better not world. a better India, <laughs> but a better world. Yes, yeah, yeah, so absolutely, the, absolutely. But I have to come back to that one thing we talked about, right? How did two engineers become India's most powerful storytellers. I mean, were you guys always good storytellers? How did how did that happen? <laughs> uh, no, I, 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 firstly, I do think that that title is a little, uh, very heavily loaded uh, to say the most powerful storyteller. Uh, but, but I think um, I think it's it started because we were so passionate about the fact that these stories need to be told. Right. So a lot of our storytelling came in um, reflective of that passion. Uh, and I think the moment you kind of do that, um, it really goes far and wide. Uh, because if we were to say, hey, I want to set up a media company and I'm going to tell stories, I don't think we would have worked. Uh, we came yeah. in with the idea that, look, there is a mission here. Someone needs to, someone needs to give a spotlight to these people who are making a difference. And, and the moment we started doing that, um, we were so passionate that it was just, we were relentlessly at it. And as you, of course, keep doing something over and over again, you start tending to become better at it. And I think over a period of time, we really kind of 
uh, understood how to do better storytelling, how to really make all these complex issues relatable to an average citizen out there who's otherwise, uh, you know, it's otherwise devoid of time to uh, spend on, on understanding these things. Uh, so how do you kind of do that? How the new content formats that you use and all of that? I think, I think everything stems from the fact that we are so, so passionate about wanting to make this happen. And uh, I think that's, that's how it happened. They were absolutely fabulous. I wish we could continue this conversation. Uh, just so much to talk about. Maybe we'll bring you back soon for another session. But it's just been fantastic to talk to you. Uh, you know, my key takeaway is be very clear about what you believe in. I mean, you guys are so clear about your need to use technology to create impact. I mean, that's the design principle, if I may put it that way, for everything that you do. Uh, be passionate about it and build a team that is absolutely passionate about it. I think yeah. that is going to be so important for, for everyone. And uh, third, it's, it's all about trust at the end of the day. Um, and, and you have to think about building trust from the very beginning, if not before, um, and not as an afterthought. And I think you have, for me, you have, you know, it, you have shown us, you've proven that trust absolutely pays. Um, you have today built a business model which is sustainable, which absolutely has a path for growth. Um, you know, we just talked about so many different options. Um, and, and to me, that that's the best example that one can give in today's world, the, not just the importance of trust, but how trust actually pays in business. Mm -hmm. right? um, so thank you so much for taking the time. And next time, tell Anu I am going to get her. I would love to have Absolutely. this conversation with her too. Just, she has a different perspective, but uh, fabulous talking to you. And thanks a ton. Thank you so much, Devjani. Really, really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much for having me here. Thanks and all the best. Thank you.